Namaste. I forget you are so No, I shouldn't sit down. Hello, everyone. This is our seventh annual Lit Crawl and the first one hosted on Zoom. As I said to all of you earlier, this will be great. It will be different and we'll all enjoy it. But I certainly hope that next year at this time, we will be back in the restaurants and bars of Norwalk having drinks and snacks. So uh, tonight, you'll have to be doing that in your own homes. And I'm getting a signal from my lawyer. No, I guess I'm okay. So I want to uh, kick this off with someone whom you all know and someone who is the leader of the library, the savior of the library, the inspiration for our library. And that person is Alex Knopp. And he will give you our uh, official welcome. Alex? Ah. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, can, can I be heard? Yes. Okay, already. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. It may be the seventh lit crawl. It's the first new normal <laughs> lit crawl. And uh, I'd like to just uh, make four brief points if I could. First of all, it's great to see everybody. I don't see a lot of people these days, and it's wonderful to see all your faces. And I hope you and your families have been healthy and safe and staying inside and washing your hands. Um, and we hope that you will continue there because it's not time to stop. Uh, second, I want to thank our terrific library staff for doing so much during the pandemic to make sure that people in Norwalk still have access to the great resources of the Norwalk Library, and in particular, the leadership of Chris, of Lori, of Cindy, and Vicki and the Children's Library have been just fantastic to refresh our collection, to put new programming on, to make the library accessible online. Uh, so thank you very much, Chris and Lori and everybody else from the library who's there. Uh, third, let me thank all the readers and poets and authors tonight for coming up with inspired works. I live with a, a writer, so I know that Writing is one of the things that you can do during self-isolation. Hasn't helped my golf game very much, but my <laughs> wife is turning out a thousand words a day. 
So uh, for her, it's been great. So thank you all for participating. And the last thing I want to say is this. You know, there's a lot of talk these days in the news about what will be the new normal for shopping or for dining or for going to the parks. But we're also going to need to figure out a new normal for undoing the social isolation and restoring a real public civic culture. And I just want you to know that I'm so proud to be associated with the Norwalk Public Library because I think throughout the country, libraries will be playing an even more important role in being the community room of a city or a town where we can start to regenerate the public culture that we all do to make democracy happen, to make the arts come alive and to restore our mutual respect and humanity for each other after this terrible, terrible uh, pandemic. So have a wonderful time tonight. I can't wait to hear uh, all of your uh, creative works. And Chris, thanks again for organizing this. Thank you, Alex, for all that you do for the library and for our city. We appreciate it. Next up is another person who has done an awful lot for our city in many different capacities, and that is Aaron Herring. And Aaron has, I know, a special poem for us tonight, something that means a lot to her. So Aaron, I know you're here. Hold on. We're still, Al this, we know this is not um, Aaron, this is still Alex here. But Erin will be up momentarily, we promise. <laughs> She's still here, I'm sure. Okay, should, that's okay. Do you wanna move along to Annika? Oh, she's on, all right, good, good. Okay, Erin. All right. Take it away, yeah. Can you hear me? There's okay. Erin, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I'm going to read When Erin First Rose by William Drennan. When Aaron first rose from the dark swelling flood, God blessed the green, the green island and saw it was good. The emerald of Europe, it sparkled and shone in the ring of the world, the most precious stone. In her sun, in her soil, in her station thrice blessed, with her back towards Britain and her face to the west, Aaron stands proudly insular on her steep shore and strikes her harp high mid the ocean's deep roar. But when its soft tones seem to mourn and to weep, the dark chain of silence is thrown o'er the deep. At the thought of the past, the tears gush from her eyes, and the pulse of her heart makes her white bosom rise. O oh, sons of green Erin, lament o'er the time when religion was war and our country a crime. When man in God's image inverted his plan, and molded his God in the image of man. When the interest of state wrought the general woe, a stra stranger a friend and the native a foe. While the mother rejoiced or the children oppressed and clasped the invader more close to her breast. When the pale for the body and the pale for the soul, church and state joined in compact to concert to conquer the whole as in Shannon has, was stained with Milesian blood, eyed each other askance and pronounced it was good. By the groans they, that ascend from your forefather's grave for their country thus left to the brute and the slave. Drive the demon of bigotry home to its den where Britain made brutes, now let Aaron make men. Let my sons like the leaves of the shamrock unite a partition of sex from one footstock of right. Give each his full share of the earth and the sky, nor fatten the slave where the serpent should die. Alas for poor Aaron, that some are still seen who would dye the grass red for their hatred to green. Yet, oh, when you're up and they're down, let them live. Then yield them the mercy which they would not give. Arm of Aaron, be strong, be gentle and brave, and uplifted to strike, 
be still ready to save. Let no feeling of vengeance presume to defile the cause of or men of the Emerald Isle. The cause it is good and the men they are true and the green shall outlive both the orange and blue and the triumphs of Erin her daughter shall share with the full swelling chest and the fair flowing hair. Their bosoms heave high for the worthy and brave, but no coward shall rest in that soft swelling wave. Men of our Aaron, awake and make haste to the blessed. Rise, arch of the ocean and queen of the west. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Aaron. Aaron has participated, I believe, in every one of the seven lit crawls, and it was great to see you tonight. Next up is Annika Aman. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly, Annika. And uh, we should have you up in a minute. Okay. Am I? Am I up? Hi, my name is Annika Aman. I'm a freshman at Brian McMahon High School, and I wrote this poem called The Road about the disorientation that we all may feel right now, just about the current situation. So here we go. We walk along a road in the dark, eerily silent, no snapping of twigs or snatches of whispers to tell us where to go. We don't know anymore. We step with a feverish haste through the rough, rocky trail, stumbling blindly into the unknown. In, out, heart pounding in our ears, pulse echoing, voices whisper. Eyes open, and slowly we shake the sleep from our minds, willing it all to have been inside ourselves. A fear, a dream, a nightmarish tint of our subconscious, but no. The days melt into a sluggish haze, where yesterdays and tomorrows stretch out seemingly infinitely where time is meaningless. In our dreams, we're rushing down the road and there are voices getting louder and the loudest reassures us that there is no darkness. No, just kidding, there is. Don't listen to the voices. There are no voices. What voices? Later, in the filmy thickness of the endless afternoons, the produce is interrogated upon its arrival, scrubbed and scrutinized like it is guilty of some sinister scheme, like the apples have something to hide. And maybe they do, we don't know anymore. We are unraveled, we are undone. We are tripping on the road where it drops off in rough patches, where cracks run alongside it. And the voices are screaming. Do they not see the darkness? They're shrieking, open, open, open. Our eyes open, there is still darkness. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Annika. What, uh, this is a uh, very good uh, scheduling here because you are certainly a credit to our public school system here in Norwalk. And following you in the Lit Crawl is someone who has had so much to do with the excellence of that school system. And that would be Board of Education member Heidi Keys. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you, Annika. That was beautifully done. I was quite excited when I heard that you were from Brian McMahon High School. So that was a beautifully written and well said by you. So thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me again come this year. I hope everyone is safe and well. And now I will move on to my poem. It's actually a very special poem um, to me, especially given the times that we're currently in. The name of the poem is called After a While by Veronica A. Schofstall. After a while, you learn the subtle difference between holding a hand and chaining a soul. And you learn that love doesn't mean leaning and company doesn't always mean security. And you begin to learn that kisses aren't contracts and presents aren't promises. And you begin to accept your defeats with your head up and your eyes ahead. With the grace of a woman, not the grief of a child. And you learn to build all your roads on today because tomorrow's ground is too uncertain for plans, and futures have a way of falling down in mid-flight. After a while, you learn that even sunshine burns if you get too much, 
So you plant your own garden and decorate your own soul instead of waiting for someone to bring you flowers. And you learn that you really can endure, that you really are strong, that you really do have worth. And you learn and you learn. With every goodbye, you learn. Thank you. Wonderful, Heidi. Thank you so much, Heidi. I, I've always enjoyed what you've read for the Lit Crawls, and this one certainly was tops. Next up is someone else who has had a lot to do with education in Norwalk and was educated in Norwalk, and that's the library's very own Cindy Leahy. Cindy? Nope. <laughs> Yikes. Cindy. Hi. I can't believe it's the seventh annual Lit Crawl. Over the years, we've had snow and ice, rain and wind, and now a pandemic, but nothing stops the Norwalk Lit Crawl. I was so pleased to be a part of this each year. This year, in honor of books and reading, I found something I selected from a blog called Books Kids Blog. The poem was prefaced with a quote that I'd like to read first. Oh, for a nook and a storybook, with tales both new and old, for a jolly good book whereon to look, it's better to me than gold. And that's from an old English song. Um, April is National Poetry Month, and in honor of the celebration of the largest uh, literary celebration in the world, the authors of this blog compiled a list of 26 of their favorite poems about books, of course books. These inspiring poems took the reader into the fascinating world of books. I've selected one of these poems to read. The poem is entitled, I Opened a Book by Julia Donaldson. I opened a book and in I strode. Now nobody can find me. I've left my chair, my house, my road, my town and my world behind me. I'm wearing the cloak I've slipped on the ring. I've swallowed the magic potion. I fought with a dragon, dined with a king and dived into a bottomless ocean. I opened a book and made some friends. I shared their laughter, tears and laughter, and followed the road with its bumps and bends to the happily ever after. I finished my book, and out I came. The cloak can no longer hide me. My chair and my house are just the same, but I have the book inside me. Thank you. Oh, Cindy. That was for all the book lovers, and I know there are a lot of us in the audience. Just wonderful. Thank you so much. Next up, we have another Norwalk Public Library person uh, who is also a very accomplished poet, and that would be Sally Knacker. Sally? Hi. Can you see me and hear me? Okay. Hi. Cindy, that was great. Um, what I miss is the little live applause, though, after each poet. That was so nice. So we'll just imagine that. I chose to read um, my poem called The Visit, which um, I wrote last summer. And I, I think I chose to read this one now because of the time we're in. And I take a lot of walks in the woods. And um, you, you can still have encounters, close encounters, you know, communication with animals. and, and I don't know, I just chose to read this because of that. The Visit. Rounding the corner of a back road slow, I saw a gentle doe very close to my window, tucked in a swarm of orange lilies. Her head came very near to my car, as though she were going to cross the road. Yet in a slow motion instant, her soft eyes brushed my own gaze from a place far and ancient. And I knew the deer as she curved her neck and body fish-like and returned to the swarm of the tiger lilies, so open and warm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. You are such an accomplished poet and we're, we're happy to have you with us. I just realized that other, after Alex's introduction, all of the other readers have been women and next up is uh, Jeff Miller, who's 
not only a man, but he's reading a poem by Charles Bukowski, who is definitely a, a poet for, for men. And so we look forward to this. Jeff? Thank you, Chris. Um, a little background on Bukowski. Uh, he was born in Germany, lived in LA. Uh, his life mainly consisted of uh, drinking, going to the racetrack, chasing women, and uh, avoiding work, like all my little like. A life like that. <laughs> but this poem is everything but, and it's pretty, uh, pretty relevant to today's world. And here it is. There is a loneliness in this world so great that you can see it in the slow movement of the hands of a clock. People so tired, mutilated either by love or no love. People just are not good to each other, one-on-one. -on -one. The rich are not good to the rich. The poor are not good to the poor. We are afraid. Our educational system tells us that we can all be big ass winners. It hasn't told us about the gutters or the suicides. Or the terror of one person aching in one place alone, untouched, unspoken to, watering a plant. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and the Norwalk Public Library for hosting this. We all know who know the, the most important person in this town is the librarian. She keeps us and makes us Jeff, thank you so much. And uh, you will be followed by another man, another gentleman, Wayne Lysobi. And uh, Wayne, I'm afraid, has been having problems with his video, but thank goodness not with his audio, because this is a poetry reading. So Wayne, uh, we will see, probably see your name, and at least we can hear your poem. Thank you. Okay, well, since I only have audio, I'm going to have to try to put a little extra effort into the uh, into the audio. So, um, just just picture somebody good looking reading this, and, and and we'll be okay. So this poem was inspired by one of those stories about snakes in a toilet bowl, snakes in a toilet tank, and I, I have a I have a poet friend named Vanji King. And Vanjie is known for not being very fond of snakes. So I saw one of these, you know, snakes in a toilet bowl story, and I wrote a verse, and then Vanjie wrote a verse. I wrote another one. So we have a poem, and it's called Slitherer. It slithered, it slid, it lurked all about. It bathed in the toilet, it waited, no doubt, to slime and to nip to hiss and to bite, to scare the bejesus out of Vanji some night. The snake was bored with his tired old hole, a new place to play, a nice roomy bowl, was startled and splashed by a 3 a.m. flush. The next who sat down got bit on the tush. The victim jumped high, their head hit the ceiling, crashing back down, the whole place was reeling. The bowl that got cracked, the water did flow. Just where the snake went, don't nobody know. She flew through the room as water did flow out of the house, the first place to go. Grabbed robe and slippers and escaped from the loo. She screamed when she found the snake now in her shoe. It wrapped round her ankle, it tickled her foot and nibbled on toes, it couldn't be shook. Off came the slipper, and then she got bold with panic strong grip. Snake's head she got hold. She shook him this way and she shook him that. She flung him a mile and that's about that. The end. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so. Wayne. That was fabulous. And you certainly made up for the video with your fabulous reading. Slitherer, I'm gonna remember that one. Thank you. Uh, next up is someone who we will see as well as here, and that is Wendy Bodden. Hi there. Got the video, got the audio? Okay. Um, so as things have slowed down for, I think, all of us the last few weeks, uh, or so many of us, I've been surprised at how tired uh, 
um, you know, I felt. And others have shared similar feelings about that. And um, then I thought about the tireless efforts of uh, all the people on the front lines in healthcare and our grocery people and pharmacists and our garbage and recycling guys. And I was filled with such great gratitude um, for them. And I stumbled upon this poem by John O'Donohue, which is the one I wanted to share with you this evening. When the rhythm of the heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks. Then all the unattended stress falls in on the mind like an endless increasing weight. The light in the mind becomes dim. Things you could take in your stride before now become laborsome events of will. Weariness invades your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside you, dragging down every bone. The tide you never valued has gone out and you are marooned on unsure ground. Something within you has closed down and you cannot push yourself back to life. You have been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you has relinquished. There is nothing else to do now but rest and patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken in the race of days. At first your thinking will darken and sadness take over like listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. You have taken refuge in your senses, open up to all the small miracles you rush through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually, you will return to yourself, having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within slow time. Thank you. Wendy, that was really just what we need at this point when many of us are a little bit at the end of our ropes. And uh, thanks for bringing us back to what's important. Uh, next up will be Gregory Payne. Gregory? So, um, sorry. <clears throat> So well, I don't know if you uh, remember last year's event or not, but for some reason there were all these poems about dogs. So I decided to read a poem about a dog. So dogs these days, of course, are helping us to get through this pandemic since there are constant companions. Uh, in fact, they're having the time of their lives uh, since we're always home with them. So this poem by Cheryl, uh, Sharon Olds, double ode for Hazel, is very sad and hilarious in equal measure. It's a bit long and I apologize for that, but it's two, two poems sort of put back to back and I'll, I'll pause a bit after the first part. So double ode for Hazel. She carried rain into the house. She shook herself and in a circle around her, she rained. She carried in snow in knobs in her comb honey coat, knots which she heated and melted. She dropped herself down by the stove, domestic percussion of her bones on hardwood and steamed. And she carried her panting out of the house and it entered the local wind as mist. All this done not by her will, but done by her. Sometimes she carried a bone out through the door or waited on the sill for it to be laid in the jaws she knew to keep open and wait. She carried, she was, a devotion beyond my measuring, which traveled dawn to dusk 
to dark, one way and then another, over the sill of her dwelling, where her beloved, her ruler, commanded the clang of the metal can which held her meals, and which, when it was opened, rang like an aluminum gong. And in the woods, she would chase food which lived. She would dig and nose for it. And when he said her name, she would, reluctant, desist and follow ahead or behind. Sometimes when she needed to go out, she would rear up like a long-haired, sun-colored pony at the door. And when it opened last night, she ran, head down, in a straight line out into the cold spring evening and did not come back when called in the night or morning. Now somewhere on her native ground are her elements being returned to it, or her breath, her spirit, to the air we will breathe now, looking for her, wand passed in and out of the house, hazel, light of the home. It wasn't like her not to come back after supper. He leaned out the door and called, and the lack of those sounds of her beginning to run to his voice, at first a few hairs of sound like a low breeze, plume of a tail along a bush, paw on beech leaf, was eerie, like an illusion. Later, he went out into the dark and called. Just that morning, he had showed me the picture of her late mother, the English shepherd, so ferocious people laughed in wonder when her name comes up. In the photo, she was lying regal, the black pups of her litter sucking, the one amber one not visible. Probably under the others, he said. He chose her because she had the most intelligent, submissive nature. Hazel, he called into the night. We sat by the fire reading, and the room wasn't itself. And though he dismissed it, there came into my mind a picture of her as I had never seen her, lying down near one of the trails not on the path of pressed cones and leaves and moss, but on a rougher bed of twigs and needles and lichen and flecks of quartzite from granite. And in the vision, she did not stir. She who is the soul of stirring, I dismissed it, but I had seen it as if she were beginning to return into the earth. I don't know when he thought to check the Jeep, he had not taken her out in it, but when he opened its door, there she was, all curves of butter coat, curvetting with joy to see him. Trained by him not to bark, except at intruders, she'd remained quiet in the car when we'd stood just yards from her, calling her name. As I ramped my hands in her loose, luxurious pelt, it was as if I could feel the sweet chance of her livingness, as if her elements had begun to be dispersed and then flew back together to create this being of devotion, his longest, his golden companion. There you are. Death and resurrection Greg. in one poem. Okay. <laughs> Greg, thank you so much. And uh, yes, dogs are definitely having a moment <laughs> with all their owners home and walking them all the time. So very appropriate to, uh, for that, to read that poem tonight. Next up will be Stuart Garlick, a great friend of the library and a uh, doctor turned writer um, and a great friend of the Immigration Coalition and many other things. I don't know what Stuart's reading tonight, but I look forward to it. Stuart? Thank you, Chris. Good evening. In my younger days, many of us who subscribed to Playboy magazine would try to argue that there was quality content in there above and beyond the centerfold playmates. I would give as evidence from my side, the cartoons, illustrations, and poetry of one Shel Silverstein. 
Shell was an award-winning children's book writer, a cartoonist, an illustrator, a playwright, a poet, and a songwriter. He won two Grammys, one for writing the lyrics to Johnny Cash's hit record, A Boy Named Sue. This evening, I'd like to share with you a few of his whimsical short poems. The first is entitled, Happy Ending. There are no happy endings. Endings are the saddest part. So just give me a happy middle and a very happy start. The second is entitled Us. Me and him, him and me, we're always together as you can see. I wish he'd leave so I'd be free. I'm getting a little bit tired of he. And he may be a bit bored with me. On movies and ladies, we cannot agree. I like to dance, he loves to ski. He likes the mountains, I love the sea. I want to sleep, he has to pee. He's meaner and duller and fatter than me, but I guess there's worse things we could be. Instead of two, we could be three, me and him, him and me. The next is written with alternate lines and parentheses, illustrating a conversation between two people. It's called Just Me, Just Me. Sweet Marie, she loves just me. She also loves Maurice McGee. No, she don't, she loves just me. She also loves Louise Dupree. No, she don't, she loves just me. She also loves the willow tree. No, she don't, she loves just me. Poor, poor fool, why can't you see? She can love others and still love thee. And finally, don't change on my account. If you're sloppy, that's just fine. If you're moody, I won't mind. If you're fat, that's fine with me. If you're skinny, let it be. If you're bossy, that's all right. If you're nasty, I won't fight. If you're tough, that's just you. If you're mean, that's all right too. Whatever you are is all okay. I don't like you anyway. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart, it's got the best sense of humor and the best New York accent. Thank you so much for sharing it. Next up is a newcomer to Lit Crawl from our neighboring uh, town of Westport, and that's Catherine Schneider. Welcome, Catherine. Oh, um, actually, I'm from right here in Norwalk. Don't worry, don't worry, no, no, no big deal, no big deal. <laughs> um, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm from here in in Norwalk, um, and um, you know, recently my book was just published, uh, so I'm really excited about that. It's called "I Used to Remember the Story of How." Anyways, uh, tonight I'll be reading for you a poem called "Small Stray Rocks." Um, it evokes some of the, you know, uh, our, our beach landscape here in coastal Connecticut. Um, and uh, also the process of writing. So I thought it would be appropriate to share um, for my first lit crawl tonight. Here we go. Small stray rocks. I sit at the edge of the sound as white light sings out between broad strokes of cloud. My friend, he's skipping stones. I watch them jump across the current, leaping at first, just tapping the surface, then hopping splashes before sinking. His hands are thick and rivered with veins, gripping rocks and launching them. His hands gently comb the hard, smooth shore for small stray rocks like words, so particular about them, selecting only certain ones of the few he finds, to believe they will go far before sinking, after leaving his palm where they are waiting, so solid and cool he could almost taste them on his articulate tongue. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Catherine. That was lovely. And congratulations on your publication. That's quite an accomplishment. Next up is another newcomer to the Lit Crawl, Larry Jabonski. Larry? Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, disclosure off the bat, uh, this poem was written before, importantly, before the word pandemic invaded our lexicon and our lives. However, uh, it's called, It Pays to be Strong. 
It's not exactly a sing-along, but there's an audience participation opportunity in seven refrains. You'll get the idea. Here goes. It pays to be strong. Long way from Laos to Amarillo, he wonders what possessed her to go. From single party socialists to wild and woolly Western trysts, fools suffer still, hoping she will come back before long. It pays to be strong. See, it's easy. Empty bottles, smothered cigarettes, Mr. Christopher gathers regrets. Holy on high magnificence, reduced to drunken reticence. Sainthood removed, heaven has moved earth by doing wrong. It pays to be strong. They sit sanguine among the depraved, believing the season will be saved. Mass delusion emboldens them like great legs with a turned up hem. Let reason swill beyond their will the maddening throng. It pays to be strong. Two, proceeding haplessly as one, family paired to mother and son, tragedy keeps them together. Birds of a red wretched feather. Oh, what a shame to share the blame that needn't belong. It pays to be strong. Mountains do not abide mistakes. Indecision prompts unlucky breaks. A hard road to recovery, psychedelic discovery. Roll up a sleeve, land make believe, possessed by song. It pays to be strong. Belie the powers of invention, a pious sea of inattention. Wait a while with John the Baptist, scam the meteorologist, feather the storm, adorn the norm, a festoon sarong, it pays to be strong. No more shall we attribute our faults to large amounts of specialty malts. We will dine with faltering friends until this loathsome story ends. Gnaw off a leg, or better, beg someone, bang a gong, it pays to be strong. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening and thanks for being strong. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you. It, <laughs> you've got that right. It does pay to be strong. And, you know, I have to admire your shirt and tie also. Sorry. <laughs> you look great. Um, next up is someone whom everyone in Norwalk knows. A great, great jazz musician. A great friend of the library and a great friend to this city from serving on the BET, a thankless task <laughs> uh, for many years and for entertaining us so often with his wonderful music. It saddened me so much when we had to close uh, the library this winter because we missed some of Jim's concerts and we all looked forward to them. But anyway, hopefully, you know, we'll go forward with more concerts. And I know Jim has been posting some work online as well. Uh, sorry about talking too much, but can't say enough good about Jim. You're on. <laughs> That's for all, can you hear that applause? That was for all you poets and poetry lovers. Uh, and, and thanks, Chris, that's very, very sweet of you. Um, it is odd as a performer to not, to not be performing. Uh, and yet for all of us, and I think many, if not most of us here are, 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 are creative souls and probably you're all, uh, creating in one, in one way or another. So it's nice to be able to share some of that creativity tonight. So my poem is by uh, Billy Collins, who was the uh, Poet Laureate of the United States from 2001 to 2002. Mm -hmm. And this is from his book, uh, Sailing Alone um, Around the Room, Sailing, sailing, uh, sailing Alone Around the World. So this is a poem called Serenade. Let the other boys from the village gather under your window and strum their bean-shaped guitars. Let them huddle under your balcony, heavy with flowers, and fill the night with their longing. Locals in luminous shirts yodeling over their three simple chords, hoping for a glimpse of your moonlit arm. Meanwhile, I will bide my time and continue my lessons on the zither and my study of the miniature bassoon. Every morning, I will walk the corridor to the music room lined with fierce portraits of my ancestors, knowing there is nothing like practice 
to devour the hours of life. Sheets of music floating down, a double reed in my mouth or my fingers curled over a row of wakeful strings. And if this is not enough to rouse you from your light sleep and lure you through the open doors, I will apply myself to the pyrophone, the double lap dulcimer, the glass arena, and the tiny thumb piano. I will be the strange one, the pale eccentric who wears the same clothes every day. The one at the train station carrying the black case shaped like nothing you have seen before. I will be their irresistible misfit who sends up over a ledge of flowers sounds no woman has ever heard. The one who longs to see your face framed by bougainvillea, perplexed but full of charity, looking down at me as I finger a nameless instrument it took so many days and nights to invent. Thank you, Billy Collins. Great. Lori? Oh, yeah. Good. Oh, thanks so much, Jim. Love you. Love Billy Collins. Perfect choice. Uh, next up is someone who has a lot of experience with storytelling and story events. She is one of Norwalk's three birds, and that would be Judith Bacall. Judith. Hello. Well, it's hard to follow Jim. That was quite a performance. Well, well done. Uh, my poem is about something that is very, very important to me. It's called Coffee in Heaven by John Agard. You'll be greeted by a nice cup of coffee when you get to heaven and strains of angelic harmony. But wouldn't you be devastated if they only serve decaffeinated? Well, from the percolators of hell, your soul was assaulted by Satan's fresh espresso smell? The end. I yield my time. Judith, that is so you. Thank you so much. Love your sense of humor. And remember when David Letterman came back from his heart attack and talked about decaf, the coffee they serve in hell? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Next up, we have Janet Nazarian. And Janet has a special treat for us because it's by a poet whom we all know, or we all remember, and that would be A.A. A. Milne. Janet, thanks so much for joining us. Am I on? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Janet from AFC Urgent Care. I miss everyone, and I miss all our fabulous live Norwalk events. Hopefully, we'll all be able to be together in person soon. I chose two excerpts from Winnie the Pooh by A.A. Milne, and I chose them because I think that they're especially relevant now for what's happening uh, during this pandemic and for just keeping our mental health during this time. First one, Piglet, said Pooh. Yes, Pooh, said Piglet. Do you ever have days when everything feels not very okay at all? And sometimes you don't even know why you feel not very okay at all. You just know that you do. Piglet nodded his head sagely. Oh yes, said Piglet. I definitely have those days. I really, didn't know that, Pooh, in surprise. I would never have thought that you always, because you always seem so happy and like you have got everything in life all sorted out. Ah, said Piglet. Well, here's the thing. There are two things that you need to know, Pooh. The first thing is that even those pigs and bears and people who seem to have got everything in life all sorted out, they probably haven't actually. Everyone has days when they are not very okay at all. Some people are just better at hiding it. 
And the second thing you need to know is that it's okay to feel not very okay at all. It can be the quite normal. In fact, and all you need to do on those days when you feel not very okay at all is come and find me and tell me. Don't ever feel like you have to hide the fact you're feeling not very okay at all. Always come and tell me because I will always be there. And the second one. It occurred to Pooh and Piglet that they hadn't heard from Eeyore for several days. So they put on their hats and coats and trotted across the 100 acre wood to Eeyore's stick house Inside the house was Eeyore. Hello, Eeyore, said Pooh. Hello, Pooh. Hello, Piglet, said Eeyore in a glum sounding voice. Eeyore was silent for a moment. Am I okay? He asked eventually. Well, I don't know. To be honest, are any of us really okay? That's what I ask myself. All I can tell you, Pooh and Piglet, is that right now I feel rather sad and alone and not much fun to be around at all, which is why I haven't bothered you because you wouldn't want to waste your time hanging out with someone who's sad and alone and not very fun to be around, would you now? Pooh looked at Piglet and Piglet looked at Pooh. They both sat down, one on either side of Eeyore, in his stick house. Who looked at Piglet? Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> skipped ahead. I, Eeyore looked at them in surprise. What are you doing? We're sitting here with you, said Pooh, because we are your friends. And the friends don't care if someone is feeling sad or alone or not much fun to be around at all. True friends are there for you anyway. And so here we are. Oh, said Eeyore. Oh. And the three of them sat there in silence. And while Pooh and Piglet said nothing at all, somehow, almost imperceptibly, Eeyore started to feel a very tiny bit better because Pooh and Piglet were there. No more, no less. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you all stay safe and healthy. Oh, Janet, thank you so much, uh, friendship. Yeah, that's just what we need to rely on now, even if it's only virtual as we're all doing tonight. Thanks, Janet. Janet's also someone who's been with Lit Crawl from the beginning and we appreciate that. Next up will be Marla Sterling. Marla. Hi, I'm thrilled. This is my first Lit Crawl. And uh, so I'm really excited to be here. And um, I've chosen a poem that I wrote. I'm, I'm pretty new to poetry, but uh, it seemed to me like a good time to trot this one out. It uh, reminds me of a vacation I have with a friend. We always go out to the West Coast where she lives and the weather is always bad. So this is the poem that reminds me of that, but I think it really has to do with what's going on with us today. Bad weather walk. The report, clouds, rain, Camouflage poncho, layered over layers, backpack hunched, slog to a damp trail. It smells extravagantly of life. Kaleidoscope droplets transform slim twigs. Water dances from silvered drips. Liquid blessings from treetops plunk a slowing hood tattoo. Till blue begins warmth and smile. Clouds become mere fluff. No longer chrysalis, you pierce your poncho, unfold in sunshine, dry, and then fly on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marla. Very appropriate, uh, as you said. We appreciate that. And now we're on to Deb Monaco. Hi, uh, my first time. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, I decided to pick a poem that uh, one of them, um, I work in nursing homes and rehab centers and I had a patient who had MS and she had this poem hanging on her wall. And I, it 
said author unknown and I had written it down then and I always remembered it and I was cleaning up last week and I found it. I said, okay, this is what I'll be reading. And it's called the Don't Quit Poem. So I thought it was appropriate for the time. She was very inspiring and hopefully it will inspire others. The Don't, whoops, sorry, lost it. The Don't Quit Poem. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer in it, with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow you may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to be a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your hardest hit and when things seem worst that you must not quit. That's all. I'm done. <laughs> but I'm not. I love that, Deb. I've always loved that. And, and you're right. That's kind of what we need right now. And congratulations to you on the, on the work that you do. So important um, now more than ever. And welcome to the Lit Crawl. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is someone well known to many of us. And when you say don't quit, this is Diane Lauricell. She does not quit. She advocates for all the good things in our city and she doesn't ever quit. And we appreciate that. Uh, welcome, Diane. Oh, I was listed at 818. So hold on, I'll get my, I, I'll get, I have to get on my phone to get my Anyway, um, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to the Lit Crawl. Um, it's terrific and I really miss my friends at the library and I thank all of you for all you do in this time. It's, it's really good to know we can go back one day. Um, I was going over my old high school files. I'm trying to get through some, get rid of some clutter, which is something to do when you're idling in your home. In, in, uh, in quarantine, and I ran across a poem I read in high school for an English class, but it's a poet who has always enchanted me, and his name is E.E. E. Cummings, and his real name is Edward Estlin. I'm sure a lot of you professionals know this, but he uh, was one of the most innovative poets in his time in the, between the 20s and the 50s. And uh, while, I'm, while I'm finding my poem, uh, hold on. Here we go. Come on. Yeah, here we go. So um, anyway, he he was experimental. To he created like a distinct personal style, and I thought it was really interesting because, um, as some of you know, I like to create or be creative in my thought process and with solutions and a typical uh, Cummings poem is like it's so spare and it's so precise he employs just a few words but he does so someone has said eccentric eccentrically uh, he places words on the page and I actually think he's a painter with words when you actually see one of his poems uh, one, uh, some of the words are invented. He revised grammar and linguistics and the rules, and he made avant-garde experimental poems attractive to the general public. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so the poem I'm going to read tonight is In Just Spring. It's my ode to Earth Day and the fact that we need some lightheartedness at this time. 
In Just Spring by E.E. E. Cummings. In Just Spring. When the world is mud lush, luscious, the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee. And Nettie and Bill come running from marbles and piracies, and it's spring. When the world is puddle wonderful, the queer old balloon man whistles far and wee. And Betty and Isabel come dancing from hopscotch and jump rope, and it's spring. And the goat-footed balloon man whistles far and we. That's it. Good. Diane, thanks so much. E. Cummings is one of my favorites. And that poem is one of my favorites. I mean, what words he makes, mud luscious and puddle wonderful. So thank you so much for that. Again, so appropriate. Uh, next up, and I apologize, I, I realize that we are running a bit early, and so I hope that, uh, that this does not uh, follow up your schedules, but we'll go through it as best we can. Uh, next is a, another uh, new person for Lit Crawl. We welcome Ed Lent. Okay, I'm on. Hi. Uh, great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, just want to say thanks. This has just been fantastic. Uh, thank you all the poets who are reading tonight. I'm, I'm sitting here just kind of glowing and really enjoying it. Uh, I'm gonna read a poem called Lost and Found. I feel we're all kind of lost right now, but hopefully we'll be found. Um, it's from my book, uh, which I'm very happy about, as above, so below. Um, and I write under the name Ezra Lovecroft. So although my name is Ed Lent, uh, I write under Ezra Lovecroft, so didn't want to confuse everybody with that. Okay, uh, lost and found. There is something behind the eyes that can only be seen by those who have lived many lives. It's the memory of loss, the joy of discovery that combine to color the iris and give it a spin like marble glass broken up by spaces in a spider's web. You can see it sometimes in the ancient eyes of old souls or Roman bronzes, full figures and busts that clung to darkness below the sea in sunken wreckage where they lay staring, staring out from the muck, out from mucky haze on the ocean floor for millennia. Now, perched atop a fitting granite pedestal with polished OG edge, intaglio place card, cool with air conditioning, bright man-made stars above, he has come to stand in the light beams and softly painted walls with even softer echoes. Schools of fish, now leagues of scholars and school children, stare back at you, swarm around your ankles. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the audience tonight for listening in. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everybody. Great. Thank you, Ed. That was wonderful. Next up is Erin Kiyata, who is our local newspaper reporter, and she's fairly new to, um, not to newspaper reporting, but to our neighborhood, and she's doing a wonderful job and she's also uh, reading the poem of one of my favorite poets, also Sylvia Plath. So Erin, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Chris. <laughs> I am excited to be here. Um, I'm a reporter with the Norwalk Hour, but I'm here tonight as a literature lover. Um, and I'm reading a poem, Mad Girl's Love Song by Sylvia Plath. Um, she's one of my favorite poets and authors and this poem was published at the end of her first and only novel, The Bell Jar. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I lift my lids and all is born again. I think I made you up inside my head. The stars go waltzing out in blue and red and arbitrary blackness gallops in. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I dreamed that you bewitched me into bed and sung me moonstruck, kissed me quite insane. I think I made you up inside my head. 
God topples from the sky, hell's fires fade, exit seraphim and Satan's men. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I fancy you'd return the way you said, but I grow old and I forget your name. I think I made you up inside my head. I should have loved a thunderbird instead. At least when spring comes, they roar back again. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I think I made you up inside my head. Great. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much. She, we lost her way too soon, didn't we? So, yes. so much for joining us. Uh, next up, um, again, we have a voice without a face, and she has a lovely face, so that's too bad, but Marsha Whitman is joining us now, and we'll, oh, no, there she is, there we have her, her Marsha, oh, good, okay, okay, take it away, take it away. Well, good evening. I'm the third person who is new to Lit Crawl this year, and I am also, um, I'm going to read from my new book entitled Holding the Body Back, um, which was published in January. And the first poem is um, two short poems um, I would like to read is a Connecticut scene called Winter Vegetables. At the Morgan Horse Farm in Bloomfield, where for room and board I did the morning stable chores, my landlady Helen French kept one acre planted with vegetables for every season. From asparagus to winter squash, the kitchen fogged with huge pots, boiling jars for the putting up of produce for the frozen months. Come January, reaching through the snow, she pulled the pale parsnips from their frosty mounds. In the kitchen, I set the table with its plastic checkered cloth. It squeezed against the wall of faded paint and magazine clippings between stove and sink on cracked linoleum. She told me tales of driving one horse sleighs the 13 miles to Suffield in the years when snow paved the ground from December to March, trotting through slumbering tobacco fields to supper at the congregational church with its predictable offerings, tomatoes, cucumbers, potatoes, beets, pickled and canned, boiled and baked. She flavored my imagination with sugar, salt, and smoke, all the while paring and steaming the parsnips, setting them alongside the simmering stew, pumpkin bread, strawberry jam, and succotash, serving up a midwinter banquet from the nourishing goodness of the year. And now something totally different called A Life in Idioms. I dodged the bullet, beat the odds, caught the cancer in time, a near miss. I barked up the wrong tree, missed the boat, got caught in the crossfires, lost my touch. I didn't sweat the small stuff, cry over spilt milk. Once in a blue moon, I got a second chance. I sat tight, pitched in, cut to the chase, did the right thing, faced the music. I put my shoulder to the wheel, kept my eye on the ball, jumped on the bandwagon, and still alive and kicking. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this evening so much for my first time out. Great, love great. that. That was great, Marcia. Thank you, so glad you could join us. Uh, next is someone whom I've known for a long time and I consider a dear friend. Uh, she is uh, a <clears throat> professor at Norwalk Community College and a great friend of the arts in Norwalk and has done so much through the Arts Commission and in other ways to, to improve our artistic sensibilities. And that would be Melissa Slattery. Welcome, Melissa. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm, I'm <laughs> very, very touched. Thanks. And thank you to everyone at the library. I, I filled out a, um, some survey at the New York Times, what do you miss the most? And I miss libraries, really. I miss my library. So thank you for doing this. Uh, I have two poems tonight. 
they're short. The first I, I, someone read in a Zoom meeting and everyone was like, oh, that's such a wonderful poem. So I'm going to read that first and then I've got another. So this is called The Clearing by Martha Postle Waite. And it goes this way. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize it and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world. And then the other one I've got is one that I wrote on Easter. And I, um, on, on Facebook, I friended a, a group called the Public Domain Review. And because it was Easter, they had an image of a peasant in 16th century Austria doing a dance with an egg. And that was something that was done in farming communities. And it, it, um, it was a test of skill and um, deftness if you could negotiate a, a, a little area strewn with eggs. And somehow I just, this poem just came. Uh, so I'll read it and then I'll explain. So it's uh, called Egg Dance. To perform a true egg dance, you must thread your way through a dozen fragilities. Every sense must open to this exact moment with eyes to see small spaces, take very small breaths, ears to hear a slight shift in tone. The air purrs and gasps at the edge stop to feel the mouth taste salt on the wind. Is it sweat or the sea? Touch the air to glide on silk or stumble slightly on the grit of sand or brush away a tangle of hair still warm with heat. Smell that? It's almost sweet, a whispered vapor. It is your heart expanding as you near the end of 12 unshattered orbs, lift your arms overhead, inhale deep, and quietly rejoice. And um, Anthony Fauci came to mind for me when he negotiated facts and fiction in the daily um, updates. So thank you for <laughs> doing this. <laughs> then thank you for acknowledging Anthony Fauci. I remember on the list, one of the readers had said that, that their poem was dedicated to him, but I forgot that it was you, Melissa. So that's very appropriate. Thank you. Next up is another person who has done so much for Norwalk. He has served on boards and commissions. He has been a founder of so many important organizations and always in, in an upbeat, cheerful way. Even when he's criticizing the government, he, he still always does it with a, a, just a great spirit. And I also have personally seen him in the middle of a planting that was a donation from his 
company, Tulip Tree Design, d pulling out weeds. I mean, uh, Mike Mushak does it all from the, from the ridiculous to the sublime. And so we're so happy he's here with us. Uh, I do, I don't want to belabor it, but I remember one lit crawl specifically, he had his family with him and it was, they were happy to be visiting and it was such a nice spirit of community. Without further ado from me, uh, Mike Mushak. Hi, um, thank you, Chris. And uh, I guess this will be a little bit ridiculous and sublime, I guess. Um, a lot of great memories of all the past lit crawls uh, starting in Sono and then moving over to Wall Street. Uh, I just remember enjoying every single one and looking forward to it. And uh, so tonight I'm just gonna read a poem by Margaret Atwood, a favorite writer from a favorite city, Toronto, uh, in a favorite country of Canada. Uh, it's called Variations on the Word Love. And I think that everything seems exaggerated in this pandemic. Fear, uh, grief, uh, sadness, and but also lots of moments of love. So I just was thinking of reading a poem about love. So um, this is a word we use to plug holes with. It's the right size for those warm blanks in speech, for those red heart-shaped vacancies on the page that look nothing like real hearts. Add lace and you can sell it. We insert it also in the one empty space on the printed form that comes with no instructions. There are whole magazines with not much in them but the word love. You can rub it all over your body and you can cook with it too. How do we know it isn't what goes on at the, at the cool debaucheries of slugs under damp pieces of cardboard? As for the weed seedlings nosing their tough snouts up among the lettuces, they shout it, love, love, sing the, sing the soldiers, raising their glittering knives in salute. Then there's the two of us. The word is far too short for us. It has only four letters, too sparse to fill those deep, bare vacuums between the stars that press on us with their deafness. It's not love we don't wish to fall into, but that fear. This word is not enough, but it will have to do. It's a single vowel in this metallic silence, a mouth that says, oh, again and again in wonder, and pain, a breath, a finger grip on a cliffside. You can hold on or let go. The end. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Hold on or let go. <laughs> anyway, I next up is a dear friend of mine and of the libraries and of Norwalk's, Nettie Smith. I don't know if Nettie is Oh, he is here. Okay, searching for Nettie. You know, we're we're running early, which is good, but some people may be waiting. But evidently, Nettie is with us. Nettie is a musician. He's a writer. He's a poet. What more can I say, Nettie? Take it away. Sorry, Nettie. We'll get. We'll catch you later. Uh, next up, then, will be Sylvia Schultz, who is. Uh, a great librarian, worked at Westport Library for many years, and saw the light and came to the Norwalk. <laughs> <laughs> right, and we're so happy to have her with us. And uh, Sylvia, hi. Hi, well, I'm certainly delighted to be at the Norwalk Public Library. <laughs> Again, I was there years ago too. Uh, my poem is by Elizabeth Alexander. Uh, Elizabeth Alexander is a poet, educator, memoirist, scholar, and cultural advocate. Two of her books were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. She taught at Smith College, Columbia University, and Yale University, where she taught for 15 years and chaired the African American Studies Department. I will now read her poem, Praise Song for the Day, which she composed and delivered for the inauguration of President Barack Obama in 2009. Praise song for the day. 
Each day we go about our business, walking past each other, catching each other's eyes or not, about to speak or speaking. All about us is noise. All about us is noise and bramble, thorn and din, each one of our ancestors on our tongues. Someone is stitching up a hem, darning a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing the things in need of repair. Someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons on an oil drum with cello, boombox, harmonica, voice. A woman and her son wait for the bus. A farmer considers the changing sky. A teacher says, take out your pencils, begin. We encounter each other in words, words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider, reconsider. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. We walk into that which we cannot yet see. Say it plain that many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here, who laid the train tracks, raised the bridges, picked the cotton and the lettuce, built brick by brick the glittering edifices they would then keep clean and work inside of. Praise song for struggle, praise song for the day, praise song for every hand-lettered sign, the figuring it out at kitchen tables. Some live by love thy neighbor as thyself, others by first do no harm or take no more than you need. What if the mightiest word is love? Love beyond marital, filial, national. Love that casts a widening pool of light. Love with no need to preempt grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made any sentence begun, on the brink, on the brim, on the cusp. Praise song for walking forward in that light. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sylvia. Miss that guy. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for reminding us of that wonderful day of his inauguration. Uh, next up is a poet and a publisher and a great friend, again, of Norwalk and of the Norwalk Public Library, and that would be Christopher Madden. Good evening, everyone. And it's fun to see different faces. I've been teaching online, and I've talked to my students turning into Zoombies because they shut off their cameras and turn off their mics and play with their phones. So it's nice to see live people that are here voluntarily. Um, I'm gonna read two poems um, and uh, I'll not introduce one and I'll introduce the other. Uh, this is called Cubicle. In my old office, a coworker called home to sing to her dog at least twice a day in her operatic voice. It was distracting, odd, and rather troubling when we had clients on the phone, but also funny until the police came and enforced the restraining order against her. And only then, her makeup running down her face, did we learn the ex owned the dog. And it was as if her front wheel stopped and she went over the handlebars into quiet. It's cubicle. Back, back when I used to actually work with other people in, in other places. Um, and this is an orphan. I was thinking of things to read. I've, I've been writing during the pandemic and all of my stuff is, is angry and depressing. Uh, so I found sort of an orphan poem that I don't think I've ever read before live uh, or I may have, but uh, it's one I kind of forgot about, but it has nothing to do with anything. So I figured it'd be perfect for this evening. It's called The Joke Explained. I used to live in hilarious, what a riot. Cheap rent, friendly neighbors, wheelbarrows full of belly laughs, and rows of yucks grew taller than corn in late summer. One-liners and puns bloomed wild roadside, 
and folks stopped and picked them in bunches and played forget me not. It was always a blizzard of flower petals soaking your skin, and eventually they dried and flaked off like sunburn. But every last chucklehead grew tired of tears streaming down our faces and the pants wetting and snarfing milk through our noses. So we all left town, quietly ducking out on the bar tab and dispersing into the night. The funny thing is, is I can no longer tell a joke or remember any punchlines. But there was this woman there, her voice like a handshake, her smile, a tightly wound joy buzzer, and my hand still judders as I tug at memory's petals. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, thanks. Good. Oh, Chris, thanks. Your students are very, very lucky to have you, even just on Zoom. Thank, thank you. And uh, I've received word that uh, Nettie Smith has been found. Uh, he was lost, but now he's been found. And so we'll hear from Nettie. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Nettie, I can. I'm, okay. But I'm you're so not glad. muted. <laughs> I'm so glad. I've been locked up in my studio for such a long time, <laughs> talking to myself, doing my own thing. Everything around me is about me. <laughs> so I'm so happy to see faces now. I have I have this poem that I've worked on. It's a series of poems regarding um, COVID-19. My latest release uh, for song is also going to be in this theme, COVID-19. And uh, I have a thin line to operate on, uh, the line between poetry and songwriting. This particular uh, poem, it's called COVID-19. It's, it's, it's very um, interesting. It, it, you know, it's, it's, I'm recording the times that we're living in right now. So as I read it, take heed. You have robbed us of our joy. You have taken away our trust. You have made us afraid of you. One day, you'll have to go. You have caused many to worry. You have caused many to cry. You have caused many to doubt. One day, you'll have to go. You have entered in the dark. You have spread confusing lies. You have never known the truth. One day, you'll have to go. You have come to destroy life. You have come with your virus. You have robbed us of our peace. One day, you'll have to go. You have come to divide us. You have come to destroy us. You have come to conquer us. One day, you'll have to go. You'll never win, conquer or, conquer or destroy us. Through it all, we are one in all strong. You have reminded us patience, love, peace, and happiness. Uh, Nettie, thank you so much. We can always count on you to hit the right note figuratively and literally. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, oh, there they are. Oh boy, Laurel and Van, two wonderful, wonderful poets. And uh, I have to praise Laurel for a minute because she was the first poet laureate we ever had in Norwalk. And uh, did such a wonderful job. And I still remember when we could go inside the library and we <laughs> people, poets in conversation. Oh, brother, so many summer nights. I remember sitting here in the library and, and 
you had curated that so well. And uh, it, it's a distant memory now, but maybe, maybe someday we'll be back in here. But for now, we're so happy to have you both um, reading uh, online. So welcome, uh, Laurel and Van. I, I go first, but you two can do that. <laughs> we'll, we'll duke it out. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for um, having me. Um, I am going to read a, um, a poem that I wrote. It's a, um, a piece by a, um, I'm sorry, I can't even think anymore. I've been, I've been teaching online for way too long. Um, I've been writing a lot of persona poems and this is a persona poem um, and the persona's name is Charlene. Yeah, yeah. And it's all right. Um, I've been writing uh, a lot of apocalyptically themed poems, so this is one of those. It's titled Arabs in Iceland. Last night, after too many glasses of wine, Charlene decided the Middle East should move north to cool off. Iceland and Greenland didn't have civil wars. She thought they were all too busy trying to keep warm. It might be also a mark of her ignorance. Maybe Northerners fought over the best seat in the thermal springs, or whether or not the elves said yes to the new road. Conflict perhaps was inevitable. Maybe living somewhere hot exaggerated the pain, or maybe it was the sand in your sandals, the dry in your throat, the grit in your underwear, the flies little feet across your lips, dowsing for moisture. Three months of dark might create fewer bombings, but more suicides. Maybe everyone would huddle by their fires rather than setting them in the marketplace. Maybe, humbled by the northern lights, the only color on those long winter cycles when one cannot even call day by its own name, maybe then they would want only to mimic its magnificence. Charlene didn't know. She poured another glass of wine, wished she could stop shivering. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Laura. I, love your, I always love your work. Thank you. So this is Van. Uh, like Chris and Laurel, I'm teaching remotely from home. And in this uh, age of uh, stay at home, quarantine, remote learning, I'm learning to converse with birds. <laughs> They're all coming out. I hear them everywhere when I walk and so forth. So this is called Thrush Song. And it has an epigraph uh, from uh, Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau wrote, whenever a man hears it, he is young, and nature is in her spring. Whenever he hears it, it is a new world and a free country, and the gates of heaven are not shut against him. That's Thoreau, not me. So, from the deck I built with pine planks, I hear my thrush at the first warm sunset of spring, somewhere in the near woods, returned from his southern wintering, weaving his voice through the fading light. I call out with whistles and trills, mimicking his hypnotic melody in my thick human tongue. He warbles back, shifting pitch, answering me. I've never seen his russet back and wings, his white breast splashed with spots of brown, deep black eyes. He sees me, though, I'm sure, from the nest he's woven of grass and twigs taken from my yard. I'd like to think he's flown 1,500 miles from the Yucatan to Connecticut, crossed oceans and continents to resume the duet we sing at dusk and dawn, soulmates keeping the gates of heaven open. He'll come again with the morning sun, this feathered flute, to tutor my tongue and throat, but I worry about crows and cowbirds owls and hawks, worry his long migration led by stars and magnetic fields has left him depleted on this hot damaged earth, worry that the small forest to which he's returned has shrunk, no longer the new world and free country he needs to sing our song. 
I would set out berries and grubs, shield him from predators and usurpers, light his path with constellations for his journey each spring to summon me back to my youth, to teach me the poem I must learn before winter closes our throats with snow. Thank you. I always love your work as well. Thank you both so much for being part of our community and for sharing your gifts with us so unstintingly. We all appreciate it. So next up, as luck would have it, we have our current poet laureate, Bill Hayden. And um, Bill has been ha doing Zoom for some weeks now with, with our local poets and he runs a poetry workshop and um, he's a fine poet himself. So here's our poet laureate, Bill Hayden. Greetings, everyone, and uh, uh, big kudos to all the readers and poets and, uh, and writers out there who contributed wonderful works all evening. Um, I want to uh, highlight uh, with, with a, a visual before I start, it's a, sh a fairly short poem, so I have a minute or two. Uh, back in the end of December in, in 2019, remember that, that year, folks? <laughs> we had a wonderful exhibit at the library called Art and Text. And one of those uh, paintings that was in it, uh, was this one called Ode to My Dad. And I'm gonna to try to get it on the screen there where you can see it. I don't know how the light's coming through, but it's a couple of guys hugging and there's a bunch of tears there. I'm not sure how that comes through on a big screen, but hopefully there's at least a little bit of an image there you, you can see of the, uh, the two guys hugging. Okay, so here's my poem. Starts off talking about that and those of you who uh, are uh, aficionados of this form uh, know that that's uh, when you write about something, another type of work of art, when you write a poem about it, it's ekphrastic poetry writing. So some of this poem is, is ekphrastic based on that. It's titled New Year's Eve 2019 Goosebumps. Looked up at painting, two men hugging, huge tears, crystal blue and huge, like the poet's love for his dad. Through thick and thinner times, I swear I caved to see that parade of tears surrounding father and son's embrace. Twas then I felt goosebumps for the first time on New Year's Eve 2019. Later around 6 p.m. or so, a crowd composed lists of last year's regrets on slips to burn. I heard no scribbling, but just the hushed volume of the church's high arched vaults, breathing room for gathered folk, ready to lose their slips. When a haunting melody my wife loved, twas Claire de Lune brought goosebumps once again. <laughs> oh, Bill, you're good. Thank you so much for that. I love that, Claire de Lune. Thank you. Uh, next, we have another Norwalk Public Library librarian, Karen Friedman. Karen is also the one who's responsible for writing all of our press releases. So if you ever see anything in the media about the library, um, that is most likely because of Karen's work. And uh, Karen has a, a very fitting poem for tonight, Karen. Well, thank you, Chris, for the kind words. Um, I selected to read the poem, Still I Rise, by Maya Angelou. And I thought it would be uh, fitting that we end tonight's wonderful program on a note of hope and courage. You may write me down in history, with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room, just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just hope springing high, still arise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes? 
shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've... Karen paused. Oh, Karen, uh, something went wrong. My with... own backyard. There we go. Sorry. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meetings of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rousted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling I hear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. Oh, great. That's a wonderful, wonderful work, Karen. And I want you to know that another one of our readers wanted to choose that poem, but you had already taken it. Uh, thank you uh, so very much. We have one more reader in the queue, and that is Jose, again, a newcomer to Lit Crawl, and we're happy to have him. Jose. There he is. Thank, thank you very much. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I want to first of all say hello to uh, Bill Hayden and, uh, and Nettie. I know them from Curly's. <laughs> all right. And um, the piece that I'm going to write, I've been writing a sequel on, on the virus. Uh, the first one was called Mass. The second one was Quarantine. Uh, this one in particular is uh, called Hold On. And I'm not going to tell you what the, the, what the next one is. Uh, wait for another time. But anyway, here goes. Hold on. Sitting at the window and looking out where once was now. Scattered signs of life, not much more. And yet, so much time to now begin to think. Wandering, remembering, contemplating. What will come of yesterday? The hustle and the bustle. What will come of tomorrow, the fallout aftermath? What will come of today, hopes and dreams splintered and dashed, ever quarantined, mind, body, and soul? Hugs and handshakes gone, indefinitely postponed, say nay. Say nay to gone and just hold on, recovery underway. New perspectives to explore with new options to embrace. The planet and all therein rejuvenating. Smog dissipating, easing global warming. People, places, and things realigning, reuniting. So just hold on, hold on. What good in mind and heart be still left? Do quarantine deep within for hopes not lost. Tomorrow comes, just hold on. Hold on, with new dawn rising, big changes coming, do beware and prepare. For new dawn rising, big changes coming, do beware, prepare, and hold on. Jose, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you joined us and your fellow poets, and we hope to see you next year as well. Thank you. This concludes our program a bit earlier than we thought, but I do want to um, have an indulgence and read something myself. But first, I also want to uh, 
let you all know that we had planned to broadcast on Facebook Live and Lori here has been running around and tried it several times and we heard from friends through the chat that Facebook Live is having some problems. But not to worry, we've recorded tonight's Lit Crawl and Lori will be posting that to our website, to our YouTube channel, to our Facebook. And uh, we have a newsletter going out tomorrow and we'll let everyone know. This was a wonderful, wonderful program. And I just can't tell you all how happy I am that you were able to participate. So as I said, I am going to indulge myself and, and, and offer you all something I know you've heard many times before, but I can't resist it. And it's a wish blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everyone. <laughs>